Good morning. It's your big day. How are you feeling? Are you ready? I don't think you can ever be truly ready for this. Don't worry, you've trained so much, you're fully prepared. <laughs> so did everybody else. And yet every year there are hundreds of people that fail to reach the finish line. Wow, this guy really doesn't look like he's about to successfully complete his Ironman race. But maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Peter Parker, your new favorite YouTuber. Welcome to Drive for Better, a channel that can help you improve your life. As you probably noticed, the title of this video is part 2, meaning that there is part 1 somewhere. I strongly suggest that you have a look at my channel and find the part 1 and watch it after this video. Oh yes, and there's a part 3 as well. <laughs> that means that you can have a short binge watch and learn everything you need to know on why you should care about becoming an Ironman and how to become one. Alright, let's move to things that matter. Okay, let's move to chapter 3, Ironman training. Let's analyze an informative case study of an Ironman wannabe. It's a random guy who decided at some point to reach an Ironman finish line. But, as in life, not everything went exactly as planned. But you can learn from his mistakes and failings, but also from his successes, and you can just do better. And yes, you can probably guess that that guy's name is your favorite YouTuber, Peter Park. <laughs> Let's start with my background first. So believe it or not, I was not a very athletic person for most of my life. I only started running in my mid-30s. Before that time, finishing something like a 5k run was a, a massive challenge and great accomplishment. <laughs> Even after I started running, I usually did few months bursts of training just before the race, like half marathon. And then after I completed the goal, I just went back to my usual sedentary lifestyle. I was a very average, not really fast runner with really poor training habits. It wasn't until a couple of years ago when I started seriously turning my impossible Ironman dream into an actual goal. At that point in my life, I could probably swim like 20 meters before I would start drowning. <laughs> Like a break. So yes, that was a little bit scary <laughs> at first. And yes, and the last time I um, rode a bike, recreationally of course, was probably like 20 plus years ago. Starting at that point, it took me approximately 19 months of training, which was spread across few years, to take me to an Ironman start line. When I finally learned how to swim, I did my first Olympic distance triathlon. It was such an amazing relief that I didn't drown. <laughs> It felt amazing! <laughs> Alright then, so I learned how to swim, so it was time to learn how to ride a bike properly. So how did I approach that? <laughs> I started taking spin classes. <laughs> Alright, you may laugh, but, <laughs> but those spin classes, they had so well designed. They got all these attractive female and male instructors, they got this massive projector screens, amazing music. I mean, anybody can fall prey to that. So yes, that constituted my uh, proper bike training for, <laughs> for my half Ironman last year. I mean, it was that and, uh, <laughs> and a random half Ironman training program I happened to download from the internet. Oh yes, <laughs> I almost forgot about the most important part of my training. <laughs> I read David Goggins' book can't hurt me. And I felt invincible, truly. Knowing almost nothing about proper training, I started pushing myself through every single training session like super hard. I even ramped up my um, weekly runs from 10k to full marathon in four weeks. Because you know, I wanted to be a badass like David Goggins. And everything else was just an excuse for lazy people. As you can imagine, <laughs> I ended up injuring myself seriously. And it took me several weeks, almost two months to recover. Once I recovered, I lasted uh, almost two months and I got injured again. This time I almost tore my Achilles tendon. And that happened one month, yes, one month before my scheduled half Ironman race. Thank you, David Duggins. <laughs> I couldn't walk for a few days and I was this close of cancelling the whole thing and not even flying. But, in the end of the day, <laughs> I read the book, so um, I couldn't be a wuss. So I decided to attempt the race anyway. <laughs> Thank you, David, guys. <laughs> but that's not all. I, uh, I purchased my bike one day, one day, 
before my half island race. And um, not only that, <laughs> I got to ride it for 15 minutes because I learned that I had to deposit this bike in transition area and there was a deadline for that. And during those 15 minutes, I desperately tried to learn how to use those freaking clip-on pedals. And not only that, how to actually change gears on this bike. <laughs> and I failed on both fronts. <laughs> but in the end, the race turned out great. <laughs> not. It was not great. <laughs> Look at this video. This is how you should be using clip-on pedals. And, uh, and this is my pathetic attempts to actually use the clip-on pedals. <laughs> That race was <laughs> was really horrible experience. There was so much suffering. Oh my god! When it came to bike, I'm, I'm not kidding. I wanted to quit like hundred times, literally hundred times. But you know what? <laughs> David Goggins' voice was inside my head. <laughs> Thanks, man. I really mean that. So yes, I went through the gates of hell and I spent considerable time in there. <laughs> I suffered a lot. I mean, David would probably be proud of me at that point. But somehow, I made it to the finish line after seven hours. And man, I felt amazing. I mean, that was incredible. <laughs> Knowing how badly I mismanaged my training that year, I really decided to educate myself on what works and what doesn't. I searched for evidence-based training. I read research literature about exercise. I read what trainers for pros had to say about this. And it was such an enlightening experience. I finally understood how uh, dumb I was <laughs> the previous year. So I started training in January and I trained for eight months until my Ironman race. And for the first time in my life, I trained smart using the latest science of exercise. I used a couple simple rules. So things like polarized training, so 80-20 principle, things like minimum effective volume, prioritizing progress, minimizing fatigue, prioritizing recovery, and obviously avoiding injury at all costs. Most people will tell you that you probably need around 10 to 25 hours a week for a proper Ironman training. That's all. I did 7 to 9 hours of training per week for most of my months of training. And this was gradually increased to 14 hours a week, 5 weeks before the actual Ironman race. My results? <laughs> It was spectacular, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> my, uh, my bike FTP almost doubled. My running pace, I went from slightly above average to top 1%, and I started winning my age group in local races. During official races, I did uh, five kilometers in 60 minutes and 11 seconds. I did five miles in uh, 26 minutes and 17 seconds. I got around 60 new Strava course records. My VO2 uh, max jumped to uh, 68, which is uh, top 1%, as you can see on this graph. My resting heart rate, it fell to 38. And this isn't even top 1%. <laughs> it's a small fraction of the top 1% really. Just look at a graph of uh, resting heart rate distribution in population. I'm here outside of the chart and David Goggins' self-reported resting heart rate of mid-30s is just next to me, just here. I almost got as good as David on this chart. <laughs> I hope you're proud of me, man. <laughs> My results were so good, but at some point I decided to aim for a Boston qualifier marathon time during Ironman race. That would be three hours marathon run after eight hours of intense exercise. That's just insane. And it would be top 1% of Ironman marathon finishers, including the pros, of course. I signed up for every local running race there was, and I started collecting medals, but not just finisher medals. I mean like top finisher medals. I went as far with this that I even raced a local triathlon two weeks before the actual Ironman, which was already the time that I should be tapering. And I still felt good, so I did another strength training, which I wasn't supposed to be doing because it was already tapering. And then I did another intense interval training, which of course I shouldn't be doing. And then this happens. Ah. <sighs> 
I developed shin splints after my last interval training. And as you have seen on the video, a week later I could walk, but the pain was still there. So not much has changed really. This was supposed to be an exciting morning video, as this was the last day before my flight to Montreal for an Ironman race. And it turned out to be extremely frustrating instead. This year, my training had a very different approach than the previous year's training. It was injury prevention first and foremost. I employed pre and post workout routines. I gradually, very gradually, increased my weekly mileage not to exceed specific amounts. I developed a strength training to address some of my usual offenders like knees and my Achilles tendons. And it all worked amazingly well throughout the whole eight months of my Ironman training plan. But in the end, it was so successful that, uh, that I felt that I could do anything. And uh, well, I overdid it in the last few days. <laughs> At this point, <laughs> My situation was very bleak. It really didn't matter that my um, aerobic base was in excellent shape as my leg was destroyed. So, you know, you kind of need your legs for an Ironman race. So I was thinking, what should I do? Should I even fly? Should I even attempt the race? Honestly, how can you do a 140 mile race with shin splints? Then, how? But wait a minute. <laughs> Didn't David Goggins have shin splints and he continued to run with this despite the suffering? Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. I remember reading about it. Yes, he suffered greatly, but he didn't quit. He made it. So yeah, screw this. If he did it, <laughs> I can do it as well. Yes, David, I developed your callous mind. An iron mind. So yes, no challenge is too hard. Just nothing will break me at this point. And yes, I know there will be no more Boston Qualifier Marathon time, but I'll be still running. I will not be walking. I'll be running despite the freaking pain. Yes, I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> all right, so let's just forget about all this pain. This is so negative. I am about to do something epic, so I am going to enjoy it. <laughs> This is going to be epic. <laughs> Bring on the challenge. Here we go, chapter four, Ironman experience. Good morning, it's 4 a.m. We're on our way to uh, Montreal uh, with this uh, little fella. We just uh, dropped off our bike and Hopefully we'll be able to pick it up uh, at uh, Montreal as well. And uh, yeah, it looks like an exciting time, three days to go. Hi, we are in Montreal airport. Uh, so we just collected our luggage, which is excellent, because if they lost our luggage, it would be almost impossible to replace. Uh, we still have to collect our bike from the excess luggage. Really fingers crossed that we'll get it because otherwise uh, there'll be no way of actually competing. Yes, wonderful. Good news, we got a bike. <laughs> oh my god. I'm just so relieved. Uh, obviously, not this one. <laughs> It'll be a little bit tough to do it. I don't know, in this one. It's here. Wonderful. Oh my god, I'm so happy. <laughs> We are in Montreal right now. We are on our way to athletes checking. Let's go. Yeah. 
Good morning, it's your big day. How are you feeling? Are you ready? I don't think you can ever be truly ready for this. Right, I wasn't exactly a ray of sunshine at that moment. But to be fair, if somebody woke you up at 4 a.m. and told you to be ready for a whole day of suffering and your leg would still be hurting, probably wouldn't be particularly upbeat and cheerful about it. <laughs> and besides, it's actually true that you can never be fully ready for your first Ironman. During the training, you almost never do sessions that exceed 50% of your Ironman efforts. And for a good reason. A gargantuan effort closer to an Ironman distance would just destroy your training. So really, you got no way of knowing what it feels like to try to do the whole 140 miles in just one go. But let's get back to the main storyline. Once my mind and body finally woke up, my attitude has shifted. And again, I was excited and positive about the race. I spent months preparing for this, and this was finally the day I've been eagerly waiting for. Oftentimes, putting in the required work to achieve something is more important than actually achieving that goal. And on that race day, I felt that. These hundreds of hours of training transformed my body. These few years of consistency, persistence and hardship has changed me and my character. I already felt that I had gained more than I hoped for just by consistently trying to reach this crazy goal. Still, I wasn't going to give up at this point because of some pain. <laughs> I would still give all I had to reach this finish line. No excuses. the day <laughs> we're on our way to the start line wish me luck <laughs> Here we go! The pros are already in the water and age groupers are gradually joining as well. It's a rolling start where triathletes self seed themselves so the fastest swimmers are at the front. It makes sense to self seed yourself in the right place with similar swimmers next to you. You'd be less likely to be kicked in your face so yeah, you want to avoid that. The plan for the swim was very simple, just go slow and steady. The swim split takes approximately 10% of the whole Ironman race, so expending excessive amount of energy for this would not be prudent. Of course, it doesn't mean that it was going to be easy. It was almost 4 km distance after all. As planned, I started slow and steady, and after what seems like an eternity, I was sure I would be getting close to the midpoint buoy, but no, I wasn't even close. I couldn't even see it in the distance. I practiced my open water swim in a lake that was smaller than this, so there were laps and turns and it seemed like I was constantly getting somewhere. However, in this massive lake in Mont Tremblant, it seemed like I was putting in all this effort, hundreds of strokes, and I was going nowhere. But I kept reminding myself to stay relaxed and to be patient. My leg hurt less than I expected, I felt strong. My arms didn't feel like they were on fire when during my last year's half Ironman and I felt comfortable in the water. But still, honestly, it felt like it took forever to even see the midpoint buoy and way longer to finally see the beach again. I finished with one hour and 30 minutes time, which was unimpressive for the Ironman crowds, and the pace was even slower than my half Ironman pace. But that didn't matter. I felt good and ready for the bike speed, so the swim went just as planned. 
The transition tank was one kilometer away from the beach, so that meant we had to run that distance barefoot on an asphalt road. I was enjoying it regardless. I mean, we were there to become Iron Man after all. I was excited to start the bike. Yes, the prospect of doing 112 miles seems a little daunting, but I was loving it. I mean, the first two hours of it. <laughs> After that, it just went downhill. My shin was sore, but manageable. The problem started with the fact that I had to stop a few times for the porta potty. Why? I figured it's probably because of caffeine's diuretic effects. I trained without caffeine to sensitize my body to its effects for the race. But I think all caffeine's positive effects were cancelled out by my time lost in Porta Polis, fighting with my sweaty tri-suit. But hey, at least the tri-suit looks good on photos. <laughs> Things started to get progressively worse. The course contained dozens of hills, which can really suck out all your energy. After the noon, I was a toast. Literally, I forgot to use sunscreen during my transition, so my neck and arms were seriously burnt. It was sunny and 34 degrees Celsius, so I was overheated, sunburned, I got headaches, I got nauseous from trying to consume more nutrition than I was supposed to, and I got dizzy. My glycogen stores were depleted, I felt like I had no energy, and yes, everything hurt. Oh, there was so much pain. And the weirdest thing ever, my toes burned like they were on fire. And this pain wouldn't go away. I was in a serious crisis. And at that point, doing the whole 180k plus the marathon on top, that just seems ridiculous. Can't do it. No, sir. I was in a seriously dark place. But quitting was never an option, regardless of how much pain there was. Thanks, David Goggins. I needed to focus on the solution, so I started to shift my attention and to concentrate on just doing one more kilometer and one more after that. And each new sign with another 10k was greeted by loud Hell yes! I can do this <laughs> One hour later, a storm hit us with a heavy rainfall. It was a beautiful moment that cooled me down. It was a sort of a cleansing experience, a new start. Somehow I have regained energy and felt strong again for the rest of my bike. I finished my 180km ride in 6 hours and 49 minutes. Considering that the bike course was hilly, with a total elevation gain of over 6,000 feet, I felt pretty good about it. That was an equivalent of 5.59 on a flat course like Ironman Texas. Anyway, once I saw my wife Sonia cheering me on, I got new energy. I was excited for the run. I originally planned to finish my Ironman Marathon just under 3 hours. And one might think that this was a delusional target for an Ironman Marathon. That is, unless you see my 238 prediction for a standalone marathon by Stripe, my power meter. The predictions you see were based on my actual running data, and they were very accurate in the past. They were only 1 second off for my 1 mile race and 19 seconds off for my 5k race, but that was on a windy day. If you are very well trained and run very fast, it is possible to do an Iron Marathon in just 20 to 25 minutes slower than a standalone marathon. That would also put me in top 1% finishers for the Ironman run. Anyway, all of those estimates were worthless at that point. Shin splints meant that I could forget about top 1% and that it was likely that I wouldn't be able to finish the race at all. And if I was fortunate enough to finish it, it would be done way slower than expected. But walking part of it was never an acceptable option for me. I was determined to run the whole distance, no matter what. You've gotta have high standards, after all. <laughs> my run started relatively well and I was positive. There was a lot of pain in my body at the time, so one more source of pain in my leg didn't change that much really. But it had to be carefully controlled, otherwise I would break down unable to finish the whole race. So obviously I had to run slower than expected. At first I was managing it well, and as it turned out my slow pace wasn't that slow. I was overtaking dozens and then hundreds of other participants. For the first 10k I averaged 420 per kilometer or 658 per mile. If I could sustain this, I was on track for 3 hours and 3 minutes marathon. There was a lot of hurt and discomfort, but still, I was loving this. <laughs> the vibe of that Ironman experience was amazing, with hundreds of supportive volunteers and thousands of spectators cheering. I was in my element, in my zone, and it felt amazing, just like I imagined it would. What an experience! It felt like a dream, but then reality started to slowly kick in. The pain in my leg started to get worse, so I had to gradually slow down my pace, just to avoid destroying it completely. I had to stop in Porta Potty twice, and a lot of precious minutes were lost. And once you stop for a few minutes after 10 hours of intense exercise, it is really hard to get back at it. I was running through the town at the end of the first loop, and saw some other people finishing their race already. It was hard knowing that I still have to go through another 21 kilometers. Next 
15 kilometers were really rough. New different body parts started to get sore and my leg pain intensified. I couldn't risk destroying my legs so close to the finish line, so I had to slow down. To say that those kilometers were difficult would be a big understatement. It was a new, never experienced world of suffering and discomfort. And yet, around 30 kilometer, a new surprising sense of calmness and comfort arrived. As I realized that if I can just control my leg pain by running just a little bit slower, I will make it to the finish line. I will become an Iron Man. <laughs> that was the light in the tunnel I needed to survive through those dark moments. And after a few more kilometers, finally I was approaching the town. I could hear music and Mike Riley's voice from loudspeakers at the finish line. It is difficult to put in words to describe emotions that I felt at this point. When after the whole day, endless hours of suffering, I had thousands of people cheering me on, high-fiving me, when I finally saw the red carpet and the finish line. It felt ecstatic, absolutely amazing finally crossed that magical finish line and here that I was an Iron Man. summary. Was I happy about my overall time? <laughs> you bet I was. <laughs> Ironman Mont Treblon is a hilly course, so this time is approximately equivalent to 11.30, 11.45 on flat races like Ironman Florida, Texas, Barcelona or Italy. That puts me in a similar finish time as Matt from Yes Theory or Nick Berg. Yes, this guy. <laughs> and this was done with shin <laughs> Just stop, stop. Hi, I apologize for interrupting this video. I am the guy from the future. I mean, not your future. The future of that previous guy talking. Who's in the past right now, so I am a guy from my own future. Nice. <laughs> the video was recorded a few weeks ago, and since that time I got a computerized tomography CT scan of my legs. And as it turns out, I wasn't running my Ironman race with just shin splints. I was running with shin splints and a stress fracture in my right tibia bone. So yes, I was literally running on a cracked or broken bone. They could probably explain some of the pain I felt during the race, I guess. <laughs> in summary, my experience with an Ironman race ended up with a fractured leg. Alright, I will give some of you several seconds to relish in a good old Schadenfreude. Oh, and if you didn't know what a Schadenfreude is, it's a pleasure derived from other person's misfortune. So now that you know that, you can casually drop this word during your next party. And people will be inspired by how smart, sophisticated and articulate you are. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> right, where were we? Completing an Ironman with a cracked bone and shin splints is truly hardcore. So it seems that I have more in common with David Goggins that I had originally thought. But just to be clear, this was not my intention. Had I known that I had a stress fracture, I would not have run the race. It is not smart. And you should not be attempting to do the same. Discomfort, even in its extreme forms, and mental suffering might be typical for an Ironman race, and sometimes for a training as well. But pain is a different thing. Pain indicates that something could be very bad with your body. So ignoring it could be simply dangerous. If you have a pain above five out of 10 during your training, just stop whatever you're doing. And if it persists, go and see a specialist. You should know the difference between discomfort and pain. In summary, do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> oh man, I think I'll be a terrible parent. <laughs> the video started with a very good quote. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. And as it turns out, that quote is very well suited for my Ironman experience. I did go too far. It was partly because of my own overconfidence, but also partly because of my own curiosity. How far can I really push myself? When you're smashing dozens of your personal records every single month and doing things that you are absolutely certain were impossible for you a few years or even just a few months ago, you're really starting to wonder where this ends. And sure, if I didn't push myself to the limit, I would not end like this, but I will also be no 
nowhere near where I am right now. And I wouldn't crush so many impossible targets in the process. And really, I needed some rest after the Ironman, so being off running for a few months is no biggie. In the meantime, I can do truly hardcore stuff suitable for toughest Ironman. Pool running, <laughs> as seen here performed by Triathlon Taran. Cool, right? <laughs> All right, time to go back to my past. Was I happy about my overall time? <laughs> You bet I was. <laughs> and this was done with shin splints, with no personal coach, with really zero advice or coaching from anyone at any point. On a cheap bike, with the cheapest wetsuit I could find. I came up with my own training plan and learned everything from internet, YouTube, <laughs> and spent on average just eight hours a week on training. Because you know, I'm a regular guy with a full-time job, lots of other projects and other commitments as well. Oh yes, and I didn't have an army of support staff around me. Well, to be fair, I did have my wonderful wife, Sonia. She is amazing, and it wouldn't have been possible without her support. My plan for being in a top 1% marathon finishers, of course, could not happen because of my shin splints. I had to run slower to avoid breaking down my leg and DNF. But even so, I did end up in top 5% of Ironman marathon finishers. Given the circumstances, that feels awesome. <laughs> And really, regardless of whether I finish in 12 hours and 15 minutes or 16 hours and 59 minutes, the most important takeaway is that I went after a goal that just a few years ago seemed ridiculously out of reach for me and I smashed it. Crushing your own personal impossible feels exhilarating and going beyond your own limiting beliefs feels absolutely liberating. <laughs> oh, and now I have something in common with this famous dude. That's pretty cool as well. <laughs> so, can you do the same? <laughs> of course you can. Even if you are 60 plus years old woman, just look at that lady here storming the Mount Treblanc Ironman finish line. That is incredible. We humans are capable of spectacular feats if we only put our hearts and minds to it. That is, if you really want to achieve something amazing and if you're not afraid of going through a lot of discomfort and suffering in the process, you can make it. And just to be clear, it's not only pain and suffering that awaits you on this way. There's also a lot of endorphins, epinephrine, dopamine, all good stuff. So a lot more happiness, a lot more pleasure, energy and motivation in your life. And there will also be a newly gained self-respect, which will stay with you till the end of your life. If you enjoyed this video, just hit the like button so that the algorithm can suggest you more cool videos like this. And if you hit subscribe with the alarm bell on it, you will never miss a new awesome content that will help you improve your life. Alright, so since you're pumped already, let me tell you how to go about becoming an Ironman. Just click on part 3 of the mini series which you can see just here. Thanks for watching.